How to teach STEM concepts to babies. Typically developing and medically fragile. Presented by Dr. Amy Ketchum. Hi, my name is Amy Ketchum. I am recording how to teach early STEM concepts for babies with typically developing and medically fragile children from my home office. My office is painted lime green. I have long brown hair and I am wearing a light blue sweater. I'm a pediatric occupational therapist practicing in the NICU. I also teach early child development for occupational therapy doctorate students at Cedar Crest College. Today, I'll be talking about how to teach early STEM concepts to babies who are typically developing and medically fragile. <clears throat> in the NICU, I see that babies are already exploring their world, even when they're born preterm. My primary focus for preterm babies is self-regulation and sensory processing. Their sense of hearing, vision, touch, balance, taste, and smell are very important factors in development. They're also important parts of the scientific method and exploration. So let's look at each sense, how it develops, and how it plays into early STEM learning. When babies are medically fragile, whether babies are medically fragile or born with a disability or typically developing, they all have some things in common. Babies' brains double in weight in the first year and triple by the third year because of all the new connections that occur between neurons or brain cells when they are adequately stimulated. Repetition makes pathways stronger and they learn faster and retain it better. Babies develop from head to toe and from their trunk outward. That's how the direction of the <clears throat> neurons myelinate or their strength develops. Babies have approximately 1 million brain cell connections per second. It's a lot of new learning that occurs throughout that first year. STEM for babies is all about fostering that early sense of curiosity and wonder and creating a bond between caregiver and baby. It's really very simple. Parents, teachers, and caregivers just need to have that awareness. People often think that STEM means electronics, when really we want to avoid electronic toys. Studies show that electronic toys take the place of human interaction, and we will discuss how important that is. Early learning and attachment is so important because babies need to feel a bond, to feel safe and empowered, to explore their world and go out and learn on their own. <clears throat> The four C's of STEM learning are critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity. These are the things that we're fostering throughout the first year as we interact with our babies and give them enriching environments. Babies learn about the world and the information they take in through all their senses. This is really what early STEM is, learning through senses. The first sense we'll talk about is the sense of hearing. Sound is the first sense to form in utero, around 16 to 18 weeks gestation. The inner ear is formed before the fetus even has outer ears. The bones of the inner ear are connected by brain cells to the parts of the brain that interpret sound waves. One of the first sounds that babies hear is the repetitive sound of mom's heartbeat. That's rhythm. Rhythm is early math. One study found that babies will move rhythmically to the beat of a drum while still in utero. <clears throat> Excuse me. By 24 weeks, babies turn their head toward the sounds on an ultrasound. In the NICU, babies turn their head toward sounds in the incubator. So we know they're responding to auditory stimuli. As babies get older, hearing allows for language and communication, which is the strongest predictor of future academic skills. There is a direct correlation between how many words babies say at age 18 months to how well they do academically in third grade. Most important thing is to talk, read, and sing to children from the day they're born. Children need to hear approximately 1,700 words per hour spoken to them to be in the 75th percentile of words that they should hear to develop adequately adequate vocabulary. Children from adequate households typically hear 2,000 words per hour. Whereas children from 
<clears throat> welfare, children who are on welfare, typically hear an average of only 300 words per hour and start kindergarten way behind their peers because they don't have that vocabulary and they often never catch up. <clears throat> it is important to allow babies to listen to music because music stimulates both sides of the brain at once, strengthening the corpus callosum in the center of the brain. Rhythm and beats lead to counting and early math. Musical instruments create beats and rhythm and promote counting. Counting beats on a drum or strumming a guitar is a great activity. You can use instruments and encourage playing the instruments along with the beat. If children are unable to, you could hold the child's hand and strum for them or help the child beat a drum by putting your hand over their hand. Using two hands together to play a drum is great for building motor skills and eye-hand coordination. You could dance together and use direction words as the child moves, reaching hands up and down and swaying side to side. If the child is unable to move, the parent can pick them up or move them through the space. <clears throat> music is also great for, for making musical instruments. You could count out 10 beans and put them inside Easter eggs to create a maraca. <clears throat> talking about parts and whole concepts. is again, an early math skill. Talk, read, sing to babies, using early STEM words to narrate what you're doing, such as directionality words, left, right, up, down, and concept formation words, such as high, low, top, bottom. Use comparative words, like which block is bigger, which one is smaller. <clears throat> Talk about the passage of time, like yesterday and tomorrow and find patterns like red block, blue block, red block. <clears throat> it is very important to have conversational terms for the back and forth conversations with babies. <clears throat> it has been found that conversational terms tell us is one of the highest predictors of future academics, particularly at 18 months. <clears throat> so it's very important to have those back and forth conversations with babies. Even if they're not talking yet, pause and allow them to babble during the conversation. <clears throat> Vision is very poor at birth. Babies can only see about 10 to 12 inches from their face, and they can best see black, white, and red colors because the rods and cones in their eyes are not fully elongated and formed yet. Babies are born very nearsighted. Their world is very close to them. They also prefer to look at faces more than anything else, faces of mommy and daddy and their own face in a mirror. Babies can explore their world through vision before they have control of anything else. So keep things novel and unfamiliar. <clears throat> Babies do get bored of looking at the same thing. Babies can actually see best out of their peripheral vision up to about three months. So they may turn their head away from you and try to look at you from the corner of their eye to get a better focus. Babies develop depth perception right around six months in a very short window of time. So allow them opportunities to look at varying depths in the landscape, outside or in large rooms. Practice tracking with babies, holding items in front of their face and moving them horizontally and vertically so they can practice moving the tiny little muscles around their eyes to track a moving target. <clears throat> According to the American Optometric Association, every visual experience a preschooler has is an opportunity for growth and development because they use their vision to guide other learning experiences. At this early age, it's important to watch for any indication of delays in development, which can signal the presence of a vision problem. Difficulty with recognition of colors, shapes, letters, and numbers <clears throat> into the child's toddler and preschool years could indicate a vision problem. The preschool years are a time for developing the visual abilities that a child will need throughout school and their entire life. So steps taken during this time can really, and help, can really ensure um, strong visual skills. According to American Public Health Association, about 10% of preschoolers have a vision problem. However, children at this age generally do not voice complaints about their eyes, so parents and caregivers should watch for signs that could indicate a vision delay, such as sitting too close to a TV or screen, 
holding a book too close to their face, squinting, tilting their head to look at something, frequently rubbing their eyes, short attention span for the child's age, turning, one eye turning in or out, sensitivity to light, difficulty with eye-hand coordination when playing with toys, or also if they avoid um, activities that include a lot of detail. <clears throat> Some things you can do to help encourage baby's vision is bring their toys down onto the floor so that they're near to them, especially during tummy time and crawling time. So toys are within that eight to eight to 12 inch um, depth from their face. You can play activities with the child with new and different toys to give them um, different things to look at. Talk about likes and differences. Um, try to build their observational skills by pointing things out match their toys and do some pairing activities of two things that are same and different. Start talking about um, asking what the child thinks will happen next. So they start to learn to make a hypothesis. As they get older, you can then teach them how to record their hypothesis. <clears throat> Touch is the next sense we'll talk about. Skin is the largest organ, so it has a large representation in the brain. Baby massage is a great way to stimulate the skin and also teach body awareness and that sense of touch. Provide experiences for babies to process touch. touch. Provide different textures against their skin so that they can experience um, different stimulations. As newborn reflexes give way to more purposeful movement, babies begin to have more control over their hands for exploration. At 16 to 18 months, babies begin to explore more with their hands and they then have a purposeful release instead of just a grasp reflex so they can put down toys that are not interesting to them and pick up toys that are. When babies crawl, it helps, helps to strengthen the musculature of their hands, forearms, arms, and shoulders. <clears throat> So explore lots of textures, compare soft, hard, rough, smooth. Paint brushes on the skin is really great. Sensory boxes with rice, noodles, beans, playing in water, playing in sand, shaving cream, finger paint, and edible substances such as yogurt or pudding. All great for baby's sense of touch. Taste and smell is very well developed at birth. In the NICU, we have moms put a burp cloth inside their shirt and leave it in the baby's isolate when they leave. And the baby is comforted by the familiar scent of mom. Scent, the scent of taste and smell is strongest at birth. Babies are born with over 40,000 taste buds, but we as adults only have about 10,000 taste buds as we lose them over time and our sense of taste becomes less acute. Baby's sense of taste is always changing. So if you try one type of food and they don't like it, try again a few weeks later because their sense of taste could change. The sense of taste and smell can also be used to make predictions and put two things together. Maybe you always use the same soap at bath time. So as soon as they smell their, the soap, they begin to anticipate going into the bath. So that is a great way to teach cause and effect because it's such an acute sense. Um, you can also, as babies get older, use the sense of smell to make predictions. Like I smell my toothpaste, I'm about to brush my teeth. With Same with lotions, candles, different foods. Allow babies to try different foods as soon as you know that there's no allergies so that they have the opportunity to sense lots of different textures and tastes in their mouth. Again, helping to build those brain cells through experiences. <clears throat> the sense of balance begins developing at birth. Babies are born with very little scent balance. Baby carriers are great. <clears throat> Tummy time is great to build a sense of balance, giving babies lots of time and floor time, crawling on all fours, and functional sitting are all great activities to build that sense of balance and start to perceive the world from a vertical position. We love tummy time because it builds neck strength, trunk strength, and baby can explore in this position put, and put things right in front of them and bring their hands together at midline. And this is a great strengthening activity and great for vision as well. <clears throat> 
Balance <clears throat> is a good way to build STEM skills because it is a way of using movement to learn. You can challenge your baby's balance by creating obstacles that they have to climb over by putting pillows on the floor and making them climb over those things. Encourage standing, using movement on a physio ball or playground activities. These all um, stimulate the large muscle skills. Here are my, my references. Thank you so much for attending. There are lots of ways to stimulate um, these early senses to help children build the early, early STEM skills. Thank you so much. And I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Amy, that was fantastic. Um, we do have a couple questions, uh, some in the chat. And um, one is just what age do you think uh, parents should start teaching STEM? Uh, I really encourage parents to start thinking about ex teaching their children to explore the world immediately as babies are newborn. You wouldn't necessarily call that STEM, but that early exploration and wonder and curiosity is definitely an early STEM learning because um, they're using their skills that they have, whether it's their vision or their motor skills or their taste, smell, to explore their world. And as they start to learn about things, babies sort of start to put things into categories and understand that these are people and these are things that go in my mouth and this is food. And um, by exploring, that's really how they learn about their world. So I encourage parents to start with tummy time right away. We even do tummy time in the NICU for our preterm babies um, so that they have the opportunity to have that um, the feeling the textures against their skin and build the strength through their shoulder and hip girdle. Um, we always recommend that they have lots of visually stimulating things in their environment and that parents talk, read, and sing to their babies starting at newborn, even actually preterm. Um, studies show that babies do hear in utero and mommy's voice is actually amplified through the body. So we do know that babies are calmed <clears throat> by the sound of their mother's voice. Yes. So yeah, and tummy time is during awake alert playtime. It's also very important that we keep babies on their back to sleep. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> um, and another question that we have um, is, is in the chat, is there any link between babies decreasing phonemes so that they are tuned to a particular language um, and decreasing taste buds? That is, is there a similar, is there a, do those develop together, um, language and taste, I think is the question. Um. Language and taste are perceived in different parts of the brain, um, but they do both develop significantly over that first year. Um, language is really at its height in that first year when the brain is so plastic and those connections are so prime for new language. With the rate of one million brain cell connections per second, um, they're just taking in all that language information like little sponges. Um, as far as the taste buds, I think that's a little bit different. Like I said, it's perceived differently in the brain. And because we sort of lose taste buds over time, that's why we have that evolution of how babies' taste changes. Also, when babies are born, they have they can taste um, the insides of their the sides of their cheek, and even in their throat, they have taste bud receptors. So they're um, sense of taste is very acute and they're very sensitive to different tastes. They can sense the slightest change in mommy's breast milk, or if we change formula just the slightest bit in the NICU, babies are aware of it and they'll let us know if they don't like it. Um, so this is all happening simultaneously, but I don't know of a connection between language and taste. Thank you. 
there's a follow up to that question. Um, I'm going to I'm going to go to another question. We'll try to maybe follow up on that one in a second. Maybe you can take a look at it. Uh, another question in, in the Q&A is, can you talk about oral tactile exploration and safe ways to advance this? Did you say oral tactile? Mm -hmm. Oral and tactile. Yeah, I think the, the idea of the question is it can be difficult uh, to make sure that our babies are safe while they're exploring mm -hmm. um, with using all of their senses. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. Yeah, so babies do learn a lot. They gain a lot of information by putting things into their mouth um, and sort of feeling the texture and, you know, if it has the taste to it. So, you know, that is a lot of how babies learn about their world is by putting objects in their mouth. So we just need to be very cognizant that we're surrounding them with um, safe toys that are meant for teething or, you know, for children to put into their mouth that they're not going to pose any type of choking hazard. Um, and just, I think it's important to encourage that, to encourage allowing children to put things in their mouth. It's certainly hard with germs and so forth, but um being vigilant that toys are kept clean and that they're appropriate for the child, that there's nothing that would break off or become a choking hazard is really important because that is a really critical way that they're learning about their world is by seeing what it feels like in their mouth and what, what it tastes like. So the follow-up to the phonemes and um, tactile question is relative to particular geographical and cultural content, uh, context. Is, uh, is the decrease in taste buds developmentally selective in a similar uh, way that phonemes are? Okay. All right. Yes, I understand what they're asking. Um, so I don't, I don't know anatomically, like actually physiologically, if that is the case. Um, children tend to prefer what is familiar to them. Um, we know that for the study of early, of early culture in children, we know that children prefer faces that are familiar faces to them. They prefer music that's familiar to them. They prefer language that's already familiar to them. So, so yes, definitely they're going to start to have a preference for the taste that they maybe get more often in their culture. Um, and have have that preference whether anatomically the taste buds changed um, change based on that those preferences I don't know that but um, I do know that children definitely have a preference for what is familiar so um, having those cultural foods maybe in their home that they're more accustomed to versus other things that they may not have access to as younger babies um, is definitely gonna contribute to what their taste preferences are as they get older. Interesting. Yeah, and um, Amy, you already talked a lot about how um, the, all the various sensory input the children are getting um, is are clear ways to help us develop STEM learning from a, from a really early age. Can you talk a little bit more about how you support families and building on those children's strengths during exploration from the very beginning um, and but perhaps uh, related to the uh, the keynote how do you support people in seeing babies and their thinking during exploration yeah so um, I really think education is so important that we as healthcare providers or teachers educate families and make sure that they're aware that even though children aren't maybe talking back to them, they're they're listening, they're taking in information and they're starting to form the foundation for their own vocabulary. So just by us talking to children, we are helping so many new brain cell connections. And I really love kind of linking two senses together, helps children learn cause and effect, helps them to learn more comprehensively. So as children are playing and kind of manipulating their world and playing with their toys, it's great when parents narrate what they're doing, like actually say, oh, look at you picked up the blue car and now you're driving the car and oh, there you have the red car now. And now you have two cars and using, um, you know, not only narrating, but using directionality words like, oh, I see you're stacking the tower so nice and high, you know, talking about that. Um, just that linking the senses so they're sort of getting that 
auditory, you know, of understanding what they're doing as they're playing and manipulating their world. Um, that's really important. I really love encouraging parents to talk, read, sing to their babies, um, just giving that awareness that babies need those conversational turns, the back and forth conversation. Even if children aren't speaking yet, even if children have a speech delay, um, just giving them that chance where they would reply, even if it's nonverbal, that counts as a conversational turn or a serve and return, sometimes called. Um, and we know from studies done through through Lena that um, at 18 months, the more conversational turns, the better children do academically in third grade. There's sort of a direct correlation right at that age. And it's that human interaction back and forth that's so critical. So I encourage parents, you know, before their baby's even born, that they're talking and interacting with babies and using terms and words that provide a foundation for science and math and, and reading, like, you know, left and right and up and down and directionality words and time words and later and tomorrow and, you know, sort of talking about those types of things. And during the bath, talk about volume and how much water and this has more water and this has less water. And can you fill this up more? And, you know, talking about those types of things. Um, at the same time that we're getting all that great sensory information through the tactile feeling of the water on the baby's skin. So there's just so much good stuff. And I think just reiterating to parents that um, a lot of what they're doing on a daily basis can, can be heightened just a little bit by, by narrating and talking with the child through all of those things. So that's what kind of brings all those daily activities to the next level. So I think I think it's important to just kind of have that realization that linking two senses together helps the child build so many more brain cells. Amazing. And the, all of that really uh, heightens uh, what you were already talking about and creating that rich learning environment, that rich language environment. And I also thought it was interesting that you were talking about almost creating a rich visual environment because mm -hmm. baby's vision is also developing rapidly, just mm -hmm. like um, their language development. So we had a question about art that might be related to this. Can you talk about how art might be integrated into STEM opportunities for infants? Oh, yeah. Art is so important because it gives the child an opportunity to create something. So I love doing any kind of art with young children, whether it's, you know, just finger painting on the high chair tray with different colors of jello or pudding, um, or actually doing, you know, hand prints with finger paint. Um, it's such a sensory thing, art is, because it's usually, you know, such an immersive thing. I love Play-Doh and clay and creating. And I always say, as an occupational therapist, it's not the finished product, it's the process. So again, talking through that process and talking about the steps, First, we're going to do this and next this and then this. So, you know, they have sort of that semblance um, and making it as, as sensory as possible. If there can be sense involved to it, um, you know, that's even better. So, so I love art and crafts and activities such as that for young children. And I always start that with young babies. We do footprints even in the NICU. <laughs> and that's interesting that you're thinking about it in terms of maybe bringing in uh, edible materials for art, the, and it seems like that could relate back to keeping things safe, um, that if we are, because babies are going to put things in their mouth yep. uh, if, if they're doing art. Um, a lot of similar vein, uh, John is wondering if uh, there's a particular form of music that all babies seem to favor. So I always tell parents, it really doesn't have to be, there used to be this whole thing that it had to be Mozart, that it had to be classical music. And that's been a little bit disproven. What we do know is that more intricate patterns of music um, are, are um, 
just kind of build more brain cells because the thing about music is both sides of the brain are active in listening to music and perceiving music. So we have the corpus callosum that connects the sides of the brain. So when we provide the child with an with a exercise or an opportunity where both sides of the brain are active, as in listening to music, it's going to strengthen those connections across the corpus callosum. So we know that when we strengthen that corpus callosum, we're going to help both sides of the body work together better. So we know the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body and vice versa. So anything we can do where we stimulate both sides of the brain at once or bring you know the two sides of the body together we're helping to strengthen that corpus callosum which is so critically important and we do know that more intricate patterns are really great with that uh, patterns of music which would be um, classical but I always tell parents it can be any music and it, it should be music that the parents enjoy listening to so they'll be motivated to play it for their child um, so we just want to make sure it's not something that's, that's too loud or overstimulating for the baby but um, it, I usually tell parents any kind of music that they like and would like to be playing in their home is is beneficial what might it look like if a baby is overstimulated so for for a very young baby a preterm baby or a newborn baby um they it, it might be crying but they might not be able if they're too young to cry or they just don't have the lung capacity to cry uh preterm babies or medically fragile babies will tell us they're overstimulated by either motoric signs or autonomic signs some of the motoric signs we look for look for are um, arms and legs just kind of flailing around we'll see fingers splayed we'll actually see babies extend their arms um, sort of like giving a stop sign they'll avert their gaze they'll put their legs straight out we call that walking on air um, and sort of see like this hyper reflexive activity um, as far as the autonomic signs babies might um, sneeze excessively or yawn excessively um, and and these, those are also signs that they could be overstimulated. Interesting. Thanks. Uh, another question in the Q and A. Uh, I work with preschool, and there seems to be a lot of kiddos with sensory needs. Mm -hmm. Does this mean they might have missed out on exploring experiences as an infant? That's certainly possible. I know in my practice of occupational therapy when I worked with children who were adopted from um, countries where they may have been in orphanages and they did not get a lot of sensory experience or they did not get tummy time or they did not get a lot of tactile input. These were children that had a lot of sensory delay. So there definitely is a correlation between um, missed sensory experiences early on and um, having some sensory delay as older children. So that's a possibility, but that's not always the case. Um, sometimes it's just that it's a lot to process. It's a lot to take in. And sensory processing delay is very common in young children. Um, and it, it could just be, you know, that that's just how their brain operates. And that's, you know, a, a little delay for that child. I've seen both. Yeah. Um, other questions. So we don't have a whole lot more questions in the chat, but I love this presentation. And I was thinking a lot about while, um, while you were talking, uh, we hear a lot about the importance of serve and return. Mm -hmm. And Sometimes that can be hard for practitioners to really see. When we're thinking about seeing babies thinking, what, what would that maybe look like in terms of uh, babies, especially uh, pot potentially medically fragile babies? Um, does it look any different? Or what can we look for when we're wanting to see, uh, wanting to have that turn taken? How do we know when it's our turn? The, the serve and return, the back and forth conversations. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so babies as early as three weeks start to understand that pause and flow of a conversation. There have been studies that have shown that a baby will, when two people are talking, the baby will um, switch their eye gaze from the person who's speaking to the second person when the first person pauses, showing some understanding that it's, it's time for the second person to speak. So they understand this back and forth communication as early as three weeks. Um, so just sort of before babies are talking, just talking to the baby and kind of allowing that pause where they would respond. And even if it's just bringing their their eyes to you, like 
showing you eye contact, um, doing some sort of body movement that shows that they're engaging with you. Um, as they get to about three months, babies start to babble. They'll fill that space with babbling. Um, and then as they get a little bit older, the babble gets longer and longer. And then you'll start to notice that the babble reflects the language that you're speaking to them. So they'll start to kind of use the same sounds that you're using in your language as their brain is kind of paring down different sounds that they don't hear as often. And then as they get, you know, closer to a year old, when they can start to actually say words, um, it's just so important to encourage that, to ask lots of questions and encourage them to respond and to um, use the words that they do know and offer new words, give them new vocabulary as often as you can. Another comment you had made was talking about uh, you, their children are vigorously exploring with their hands around 16 to 18 months. Okay, to, Is it okay to put things in their hands to help them with the uh, touch and let oh, them yeah. feel things? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Even at much, much younger age than that. Um, yeah, for giving them lots of different textures to feel and not just in their hands, but all on their body, rubbing cotton balls or coarse washcloths or different textures against their skin just to give them the opportunity to process those different sensations. But yeah, putting things in their hand, encouraging them to switch items from one hand to the other. Um, I like to put I like to put um, toys in both of their hands and then hold out another very interesting toy that they want to engage with and, and watching it. What age do they learn? They can put one toy down and grasp the new toy. So, you know, just kind of giving them opportunities where they even have to problem solve a little bit um, and tie that into the tactile and the sensory components as we build their play and we build their opportunities for exploration. Another question is, I uh, wonder how we can approach supporting families with STEM when they may be overwhelmed. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this, Megan's saying, I remember my parents while my sister was in the NICU. It was stressful and overwhelming. Oh, yeah. How do you approach this in a way that's supportive and not adding another thing for parents to do? And we just keep it so simple. I mean, literally sitting next to the incubator and doing kangaroo care, putting the baby against your skin, that in and of itself is, is a wonderful developmental activity for the baby that they're, that they're learning through that skin to skin contact, um, reading books to the baby. I just, I like to, you know, sort of reiterate to parents that the things they're probably already doing are laying that foundation for that early sense of exploration and wonder. And, you know, just, keeping encouraging them to do all of those things even if you have a medically fragile baby you know we'll often say just give them one sense to process at a time so we're not moving them while we're talking to them we're not talking to them you know while they're getting a lot of bright lights and visual stimulation so we'll just introduce one sense at a time but as they start to get a little older and can process all of that better um, that we you know start to slowly give them more sensory input so they take that in and learn to process that but um, you know the, I think the main thing that for telling parents when they're feeling overwhelmed is just to do what comes natural holding the baby cuddling the baby singing to the baby maybe gently rocking the baby um, reading to the baby and then as as the child and, and know that that's all really beneficial stuff to building that foundation and also bonding, which is really critical, that, that bonding piece and forming that secure attachment um, is just, you know, kind of reiterating to parents that they're doing all good stuff. It might not feel like that big a deal that they read a book or swaddled or held their baby, but these are really important foundational things for for bonding and sort of starting that, that baseline of sensory input. Um, and then as the child gets older, like I said, just, you know, just heightening it a little bit, like talking to the child as they're playing, introducing new toys, giving them new and different visual stimulation because babies do get bored looking at the same thing all the time. So even like, the simplest thing is like switching their bedroom around. If they're always kind of, they're in the same place and they're always looking toward, you know, the light or the window or um, anticipating the door to open so mom and dad come in, maybe rearrange the room so they're turning and looking the other direction, move the mobile from one side of the crib to the other so they're looking out at, up at it from both varying directions so that um, 
muscles around their eyes are forming symmetrically and so forth. So it can be, it can be super simple, but all these little things are going to add up and be so beneficial. Excellent. Well, we are almost out of time. I want to thank you so much. I really love that you're thinking about how families can incorporate this in really easy ways. Um, I think one of my favorite things was just the, the idea of having that predictable smell of mom, that it's it's sensory and it's bonding uh, and um, it's how we're going to support our babies and, our, and their science thinking. Anything else as we wrap up, Amy? Um, uh, yeah, I, I just, I love this opportunity and um, thank you so much to STEMI for in including me in the STEMI Fest and uh, yeah, thanks so much. This has been great. Thank you.